I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. Never in a million years did I think they were going to make an actual, genuine sequel to the best Spongebob game, Battle for Bikini Bottom. And never did I think it was going to be so much better than that game in so many ways. And after playing a game as coral as this, we're all going to party till we're purple. Now we're finally getting into some nostalgia. SpongeBob has been around since even before I was born and is one of the earliest things I have fond memories of. If you've seen literally any previous episode of mine, you might be inclined into thinking I enjoy the show. I used to watch it constantly, sometimes even waking up early just to catch a new episode. I was so hyped for the best day ever, man. And didn't stop watching until, I don't know, sometime in high school, probably. If there was one thing I loved more than SpongeBob at the time, there wasn't, but if there was, it was video games and what do you know just like with these games one day one of my brothers got a brand new Spongebob game as a gift for his birthday Spongebob Squarepants Battle for Bikini Bottom and just like those other games my brothers didn't really play this one that much but I played it so much as a kid it blew my mind that I got to actually explore pretty much every iconic location from the show like the Krusty Krab, Rock Bottom, Goo Lagoon, Cow Throwing Pool Land? Oh wait, that's just Texas. What's the difference? <laughs> but in my case, especially at the time, I mostly just explored Jellyfish Fields and maybe downtown Bikini Bottom over and over again because I didn't know how memory cards worked. You what? But it didn't matter. I was actually in the world of my favorite show, playing as my favorite characters. And at that time, that's all that mattered. It was a collectathon similar to my other two loves growing up. Super Mario 64 and Banjo 2, and was a competent one at that. The level design was a bit more linear than those, and had some more bullshit built in. Fucking Rube Goldberg Machine Marmalade thingy! I played a couple of the other SpongeBob games made by the same developer the following years, and have lots of memories playing those as well. Even if Creature from the Krusty Krab is a bit weird, I've looked back on this trilogy of games fondly ever since, but I haven't really played any other console Spongebob games, and for what I can tell, haven't really missed that much. None of them seem to have made nearly as much of a cultural impact as Battle for Bikini Bottom, especially because of that game's huge speedrunning community over the past few years. So much so that that game actually got remade from the ground up by Purple Lamp Studios in the year 2020. This remake has some issues, but was overall a very faithful recreation with a brand new, gorgeous art style. I remember playing this remake right after I beat Bloodborne for the first time. I'm a complicated guy. And even though I was at college playing the game again, it was still a lot of fun, even if it has aged in some aspects. The game was supposed to come out alongside the up and coming new movie that was coming out at the time, until the film got delayed like 50 times. So I assumed it was just made to help advertise the movie, but didn't think it would really lead to anything else. So I just kind of continued on with my life, not really thinking any more of rehydrated. Until one random night at like 3 a.m. when I was doom scrolling through Twitter before bed, I found a new trailer for the up and coming Cosmic Shake game. And I was so excited. I literally called one of my friends because I was just freaking out so much. Dude, we haven't been friends in 10 years. Stop calling me about SpongeBob. But you don't understand. It has SpongeGar in it. It was such a well-made trailer too. It looked like it was going to be an ambitious big budget project. Are we finally getting a worthy successor to Battle for Bikini Bottom? Skip ahead a year and a half and here we are. I kind of forgot Cosmic Shake was coming out, but saw the equally fun release trailer for the game while editing the Sonic Advance video and I just knew I had to look at the game as soon as possible. So it's a good thing I have plenty of of time to look at it with nothing else screwing with my plans. <laughs> I purposely haven't looked at any other opinions or reviews or videos or whatever of this game and I still haven't really even looked at any of that stuff at the time of publishing this video. So I can go in with my full completely own fresh perspective and see if it truly lives up to Battle for Bikini Bottom and hopefully even exceeds it. For all I know this game is a pile of <laughs> regardless of any of that it has been 20 years since Battle for Bikini Bottom. Fucking old. You're old. Our journey begins with our stalwart hero, SpongeBob and Patrick, taking a trip to the loveliest place in the world, where SpongeBob sees a group of cool kids and gets sad that he is not a cool kid. Don't worry, SpongeBob. I know a way you can be cool all the time. Why is SpongeBob jealous of a bunch of kids anyway? He's an adult, right? He's literally a homeowner 
works a nine to five, pays taxes, and has lost touch with reality. Okay, I understand the jealousy now. Before reconsidering any life choices, the duo find themselves in the presence of a very trustworthy merchant named Madame Cassandra that sells SpongeBob magic bubbles that can, um, kinda do whatever he wants, but not really. He makes a bunch of wishes that end up warping reality into several different alternate versions of Bikini Bottom, but none of them really represent what SpongeBob actually wished for outside of turning Patrick into a balloon. I don't know how Squidward getting sent to the prehistoric era to be eaten is the equivalent of being appreciated for his art. That again, stomaching squid is an art all its own. <laughs> all of SpongeBob's friends end up in these alternate dimensions, and it's up to him and an inflatable Patrick, please don't Google that, to travel to these worlds and save his friends while collecting interdimensional jelly for the very friendly and very trustworthy Madame Cassandra. I once in a lifetime opportunity for world dominant. I mean saving saving the world. Okay, I believe you. The main story is very simple, but the game makes up for it by every world having its own separate mini story that all feel like a genuine episode of the show. One minute, Mr. Krabs is taking advantage of some poor saps in the Wild West. The next, Gary is literally eating people in Rock Bottom. The next, Squidward is creating a karate action movie whilst, um volunteering bystanders to perform stunts and paying them in something money could never buy. Exposure. Oh. There are a lot of cutscenes in this game, and the unfolding plots in each world are all a lot of fun to watch and inform the actual gameplay wonderfully. The writing in general is very clever and got me to laugh so many more times than I want to admit. Very reminiscent of the earliest days of the show. When I first saw that Patrick would be taking on a Navi type role instead of being playable, I was worried that meant SpongeBob was going to be the only playable character in the game. And turns out he is, but I actually think this ended up being a genius move in hindsight, because it allows SpongeBob and Patrick to have constant banter throughout each world, whether it was something plot relevant or just some stupid gag. It helped keep me engaged with what I was doing and just kept me laughing. And the humor extends further past the writing because the visual humor in almost every aspect of this game is also insane. You can't go more than two steps without some random deep cut reference to the show and gosh this stuff just brought me back to being a kid again. If you aren't a nostalgia blind Spongebob fan playing this game then yeah you're not gonna care for any of these but seeing as I am... Holy shit dude is that the invisible boat mobile? Mystery? That's my fucking horse right there! Dude I'm in an Alaskan bullworm cave! Anchovies? Dude is that Fred? Who's Fred? Why does he have a peg leg? Why are they doing that Finland traps the fucking minute a boss fight against the gloppy glove chocolate oh okay even the costumes are all references to episodes of the show and gosh i wish i unlocked the highest tier to be the quickster dude but i'll settle on being a goofy goober the actual game controls very similarly to previous Spongebob games, with Spongebob exploring vast environments, but the actual play control here has been tuned to perfection. Spongebob inherited certain moves from Patrick and Sandy, such as Patrick's belly flop or Sandy's lasso, as well as having some new moves, such as this homing bubble attack that immobilizes foes for a short time, and a sick homing karate kick that is super fun to use in platforming and combat. This is the best Spongebob has ever felt in any game he starred in. In Battle for Bikini Bottom, Spongebob's default moveset was fine, but the bowling ball and the bubble missile both high-key sucked so much to control, and I'm glad that all of his moves this time around are just generally really fun to play around with. You can even dodge roll now, which doesn't get interrupted if you dodge off a cliff. This is Speedrun Strats with Jonathan. Hi. If you dodge roll off a cliff, you don't fall and the game thinks you're still on the ground. So you can roll, then use both of your jumps to get to places you otherwise couldn't. This has been Speedrun Strats with Jonathan. Bye! Each world in Battle for Bikini Bottom kind of had a main objective, but you were just kind of told what it was in the beginning of the world, and then you would pursue said objective while completing nine other side objectives with various random characters along the way. Here, things are much more linear and narratively driven as the story unfolds throughout the world with alternate versions of the main cast taking on major roles that relate to the world's theme, even if they aren't themselves, they're kind of alternate interdimensional versions of themselves. Except Plankton and Karen for some reason. Y'all brought back fucking Prawn of all characters. 
which granted is still hilarious. He's just so lame, but couldn't bring in a single alternate version of Plankton or Karen? What the hell? You don't even really focus on collecting things this time around. Sure, there is lots of jelly to collect, which allows you to unlock more costumes and these gold doubloons that allow you access to even more costumes to purchase, but these are both completely optional. You don't need any costumes besides the ones that Cassandra give you to progress through the game. The only other collectible outside of side quests is golden spatulas, which were the main collectible in Battle for Bikini Bottom, but I, um, I have no idea what they do. I told you I wasn't looking anything up. I found, like, I think most of these. I feel like every world has at least one, and I have no clue what they're supposed to be. Maybe if you get all of them, you get a special prize, but I didn't, so I guess I'll Google it after I'm done here. All these collectibles are completely optional, while all you need to do to beat the game is go through the levels and do whatever the main objective happens to be at the time. Sometimes you'll go trick-or-treating, or maybe take over a fleet of pirate ships, take a horse riding test to get your license, retake the horse riding test when the game bugs out, abuse a giant prehistoric creature so it moves its chunky ass, giving an old lady aging cream, you know, the works. The worlds themselves stand out in a unique way. Let's see if you catch it. First one is the Wild West, Jellyfish Fields. The next one is Karate Downtown. The next one is Pirate Goo Lagoon. And the next one... And the next one... I mean, let me just get something out of my video game carrying... carrying bag here. Ah, I see. These are all just locations taken from Battle for Bikini Bottom and twisted up with a brand new theme. This game, twisting locations from its predecessor and reusing assets in new creative ways, kind of makes this game the Majora's Mask compared to Battle for Bikini Bottom's Ocarina of Time. Link even falls into a couple dimensional portals in that game, so it's not that far. Even if the game does reuse locations and some assets, the actual level design and activities you're doing here are so much different. Instead of trying to find steering wheels while wandering around downtown, you are instead helping Squidward film a karate action flick where you star as the main character. So everything you do is for the movie, including attacking innocent people because they signed the waiver, so they're fine. Plus, exposure. Oh, yeah and blinding yourself for your adoring fans. Seriously, these pictures, why? Why do they keep flashing the screen? The absolute highlight for me has to be prehistoric kelp forest, however. While probably the shortest level in the game and barely has any story worth mentioning, the variety and gameplay introduced here created such a perfect flow state for me from beginning to end. The level starts going zero to 60 in like two seconds with you needing to escape a cave on tongue. That sentence sounds a little weird saying it out loud. And the vista reveal when you get out of the cave is... Oh. The level keeps up this pace the whole time with a perfect balance of platforming, boulder rolling, combat, and so on and so forth. It's such a great level, an absolute textbook example of great level design and set pieces. The absolute worst level by far is Pirate Goo Lagoon, however. Why did this drag on for so long? It was nearly two hours, which is one fourth of my total play time. You just keep traveling to these tiny ships over and over again and fighting and defeating enemies so you can reclaim it in the name of the Flying Dutchman. Which seems fun in theory, but you just keep doing it over and over and over again, and every time you think the level is about to end, it just goes on for another 30 minutes. This is also where Prawn shows up. Stop trying to make Prawn happen. It's not going to happen. I really can only raise so many socks, and I can fight only so many enemies. Oh, that's right, the enemies. Early in the game, I was very worried about the combat because the Jellyfish Fields level has you stopping all the time to fight these jelly goons, and there was such little variety early on that I was worried these would be the only enemies we get. But over time, SpongeBob learns more moves, and more enemies are introduced that let the player take advantage of those moves, leading to combat being pretty fun and fast-paced after a certain point. Some enemies are pretty annoying, though. These jock guys, for example, all take three hits to kill each, and you can only hit them when they're in the middle of taking a little nappy wappy. Very annoying. It's not like Sonic Frontiers combat or anything, but for what it is, it is fun, and the enemy placement in the levels kept me on my toes, and helped make certain platforming sections more involved. I do wish they were more themed around the worlds rather than just being generic jelly goons. Even the movie game reskinned its enemies, so what's this game's excuse? 
Overall, I enjoyed most of the worlds, even if their lengths were not remotely consistent. Wild West, Downtown, and Sulphur Fields were all about an hour, which was the perfect length in my opinion. They all had great evolving stories and a lot of variety in the platforming. But then Rock Bottom and Kelp Forest were both like 30 minutes long each, which took me by surprise because they both came right after Goo Lagoon, which the less I say about that level, the better. The boss fights are a bit of a different story compared to the worlds, however. The first world just straight up doesn't have one at all, even though it builds up to an encounter with the fabled Alaskan bullworm. With like you going into its lair and like the cave is shaking and you hear its roaring in the background just for you to fight a bunch of enemies and then leave the cave directly after that. I guess the fight just wasn't finished? I don't know. This part was super weird. But the runaway train section that you go through instead right after it kind of makes up for it. The fights that are there are okay enough, but it's usually just you fighting against hordes of enemies while dodging projectiles that the boss throws at you and then waiting for the boss to become vulnerable so you can hit it. Some of the stuff you dodge is pretty funny though, but the bosses are definitely the weakest part of the game by far. Pretty disappointing considering the main three bosses in Battle for Bikini Bottom are the highlight of that game, especially the final boss. After saving all of our friends, the only thing left we need to save is the heart and soul of any good town. Cheap, unregulated fast food. Mmm, my favorite. So our duo heads back to the loveliest place on earth to find the Krusty Krab, so Spongebob can get to work tomorrow because YES CAPITALISM! Glove World comes with a bit of a plot twist, because you actually lose Patrick and end up needing to save him from the most dastardly villain of all. Glovey Glove. Needing to save Patrick is a cool twist because he's actually been on the same journey as you this whole time. He's always been by your side, he's always providing emotional support, he's always there to lend you more underwear when you need it. Patrick, where are you keeping Spongebob's underwear at? Your emotional attachment to saving every other character relies on you having knowledge of the show. But even if your only exposure, <laughs> the best thing to be paid in, to Spongebob is through this game, you'd still want to make sure your best bud is alright just because he's been on this journey with you this whole time. After handing Glovey his just desserts and saving Patrick, everything at Bikini Bottom is finally back to normal until another pretty underwhelming fight against a mutated Squidward and Madame Cassandra. Seriously basically the same as the other fights except this time you have the Reef Blower which is a pretty funny reference. The fight itself isn't that hard though. Besides the boss fights, I was pretty blown away by Cosmic Shake in so many ways I wasn't expecting. The game has its share of random issues and some glitches. I did literally lose a save file after my first play session and I did have to play the entire first world again for this video, so keep that in mind. But regardless, there are so many positives to this game. Some that I haven't even mentioned yet, like the gorgeous visuals or the complete banger soundtrack. I don't know why it's an unwritten rule for every SpongeBob platformer to have amazing music, but this game is no exception to that rule. The activities you do are varied, hilarious, and fun to play through, even if some are a bit simple, but the highlight is definitely the stories and dialogue featured throughout. This game made me feel like a kid again with how much fun was to be had here. I absolutely recommend the game to Spongebob fans, and even if you're just a fan of platformers, there's still a lot to enjoy here with the beautiful visuals, engaging combat, after about halfway through the game anyway, and expertly crafted level design. I freaking love this game and I can't wait to play it again. Whew. And that's how the perfect sequel was made. I'll see you guys in the next one. Hey, this is out of character Jonathan here. I'm just gonna kind of ramble about my schedule for the upcoming next few videos because they're gonna be a little different than what my original goal was. So about I don't know, 10 days ago at this point now, Nintendo decided to pull a funny in Shadow Drop huh? Metroid Prime Remastered, and I really wanted to do a video on that, so I had the crazy idea while I was making this video to have a dual release of Metroid Prime and Spongebob at the same time, where I would kind of like work on one video one day and then work on the other the next day. Uh, that did not work, so that did not work at all, so I just decided to pause production on the Metroid video and focus on this one so I could get this one out sooner. As a result of that, I have already recorded all of the footage and started writing the script for the Metroid video, so I will be releasing that one next, which I know goes against my schedule of doing a Sonic game and then a non-Sonic game and then a Sonic game, 
But to make up for that, after the Metroid Prime video comes out, I am going to do two Sonic games in a row. A specific Sonic duology. I'm sure some of you can guess what it would be. So please look forward to that. And then after those two are out, we will go back to trying to stick to the Sonic, non-Sonic, Sonic game schedule. But anyway, if that sounds exciting to you guys and you want to see more, uh, don't forget to subscribe, leave a comment, like, you know, all that stupid bullshit. I hope you all have a great night.